here at the Graduate Center CUNY in Midtown in Manhattan, a beautiful day uh, in, uh, in, in, in New York City. And um, the streets are empty, uh, no tourists, so very few people go into their offices. It's almost like a small town. Uh, um, people are walking leisurely, people are sitting outside in kind of improvised uh, structures from all the restaurants. 42nd Street, where normally, uh, 32nd Street, where normally 300,000 people come out in the morning out of uh, Penn Station. is closed for traffic and uh, it's full of restaurants and um, over Fifth Avenue up to Madison. And um, it's a very different very different feeling in this city of uncertainty and um, and uh, and New York has changed dramatically as has the situation of course we all um, uh, know that and uh, wonder what will happen with this country with this government with this president but also of course with the arts and um, we still don't perform that everything is close compared to Europe this country mismanaged so much Meanwhile, France, England, Germany, theater people are back to work. Musicians are back to work in New York. It is not the case. Musicians cannot even perform in the bars because by law um, you cannot sell um, alcohol or drinks um, alone. You have to sit down and eat because people are afraid that there are larger groups gathering. So it's a disastrous situation still for all the artists involved. And we really have to think, what does it all mean? And now at the Siegel Talk, after four months, Talking every day of the week to theater artists, we opened it up. We opened it to curators, to producers, to dramaturgs, academics, and um, writers, and um, to see what what is it, what we should think about, what's of significance, and also highlighting a bit theater performance and the political, the political of our work, like the dramaturgy and all of it, the thinking part. This is something what always should be part of it, but perhaps now we have a bit more time to to listen, perhaps more carefully read and, and to talk about it. With us today um, is uh, the great Tom Walker, a New York-based actor, director, writer, and also a teacher. And he has been with a theater company um, that has done what very few companies have done. They revolutionized theater, actually, you know, some say they're the only company, the most significant ensemble in the 20th century that really changed how we think about theater, what we are, um, uh, concerned about in the world and how the arts can make a contribution to, to, to make us think in the Brechtian way, but breaking that famous fourth wall. Um, it's the living theater, the great, great living theater that in a way does not exist anymore. Um, and like a rock, great rock band uh, that, um, that, that performed for almost 50 years. I think it was founded in 1947, the year Tom was born. And it was an incredible run with Judith and uh, Molina, Julian Back, Hanan afterwards. And Tom has been with them for a very long time, with many incarnations. Um, he was spent time with them in jail in Brazil in his first job, uh, for a job with them in 71, and, um, and performed all around the world and in small, small spaces outside often. Um, in uh, New York, he was uh, also a artistic collaborator with Theodora Skipidaris, the great, great puppeteer and artist, theater artist, the team, the assembly, Mapu Minds, and um, many, uh, many others. And now he is taking care of the archives of the Living Theater, has publishing project. We will talk a little bit um, about it, um, especially on Julian Beck and Judas Molina, but also on his uh, memoirs. So he is uh, someone who has seen a lot, who has worked a lot who has been part of significant um, productions. And um, there's a great cookbook. It's called How to, how to Cook an Egg, you know, by the Rose Bakery. And so this is, this, if you say how to do theater, Tom is someone who knows. So Tom, um, I hope you forgive my uh, long introduction. Um, really welcome, welcome, welcome um, to Siegel Talks. Thank Where you. are you? I'm uh, in my little apartment on 10th Street and 2nd Avenue in the East Village where I spend most of my time. I was spending a lot of time here already before COVID, but now it's a little more extreme. I go out every day to do a little shopping. I did get up to a friend's house in the Catskills for a couple of months at the end of August, but I went via another friend who drove up to Albany County. And then my friend drove over from Delaware County. And so we went like in secrecy 
you know, escaping the city and then slipping back on Metro North to get back. But I don't go very far away from, from 10th Street. I'd like to go out to Brooklyn to see some street theater. Some of our former artistic associates have formed a, a new group called Al Limite, which means uh, to the limit in Spanish. And they're already doing a street theater play to support the, the protest against the North Brooklyn pipeline of all things. They want to build a pipeline across Brooklyn, wouldn't you know? <laughs> and Al Limite has been doing shows in Brownsville and Bushwick and Greenpoint and Williamsburg, and uh, they're doing, you know, the great work. Uh, they all worked for the last few years with Judith Molina, and they're carrying on. Uh, they're all half my age, and uh, I'm not going to get on the subway quite yet and go out and see them, but I'm glad that's happening. Yeah. And, uh, I was very lucky to do a couple of uh, projects just before the COVID hit us. Uh, I did Theodorus Kipotaris' last show, The Transfiguration of Benjamin Banneker, about the 17th century, uh, 18th century African American uh, astronomer, and also about Ed Dwight, the first Afro American astronaut. And we did it with the drum corps from the Benjamin Banneker High School in Brooklyn and the dance corps. And it was a wonderful experience at La Mama in in January. Just eight shows, though, came mm. and went. Incredible. We thought we might try to do it in, in June out of doors or September, but that's not possible. And then I did one other project with Dennis Lee. I dramaturged his uh, workshop performance of Caligula by Camus at New Ohio for just two performances. And then mm. it was gone. You know, one of the great things Judith Molina did in her last years, she threw all her money into the Clinton Street Theater for six years, and she could always do her plays for two months. The revival of the Brig ran for five months, the revival of the Connection for two months, her other plays. She did six plays after Hannon Reznikoff's death, and they all ran for two months apiece. So this was what she spent all her money on, and at the end of it, she was indigent, and we didn't know what to do, so we asked the Actors Fund and they said, Lillian Booth. <laughs> she went off to live at Lillian Booth Actors Home, which is a wonderful place. They took great care of her. Yeah. They let her smoke marijuana out of doors. And mm -hmm. uh, it was hard for us though. It was hard for us to get out there. We, we created a system where one of us would go out each day. So every day she had a visitor from one of us. I did Mondays and uh, it was holy work and uh you know could have been worse she was 88 when she passed yeah that's true that's true yeah i think that's the great contribution brad made at the time to to be there for her judas came very often to the siegel center she would say it's the only thing when she would come still out to new york uh, often she said frank you have to do a bar, a restaurant, something. She said, I cannot go anywhere. I don't like the bars. And if I go to one, there's nobody <laughs> I know. Um, now she uh, often participated. We also did the uh, evening with her on the Pescato notebooks, the great, her great notes. Yeah. So Tom, um, this time we live in, what, what would Judith say? What would Julian say? Well, they'd be locked down like everybody else. But, you know, like so many of your guests have said, do your thing, get out there and speak the truth, like the Al Lamite people are doing. Uh, Judith would have been, you know, one of the people most in danger. I think seven people back in April were recorded having died at Lillian Booth. She would have been in the midst of tragedy there. Yeah. Uh, but in times of crisis, you know, when I joined the Libyan Theater, when I first saw them, it was 1968. And we were certainly in a crazy crisis in the United States. The inner cities were burning. The Vietnam War was raging. Uh, I had already been involved in theater at Yale. And uh, were you a theater student? Uh, I wasn't in the drama school. I was an undergraduate, but I was very involved in theater activities. Uh, and uh, when we saw the Living Theater, it just knocked my socks off. 
because it was an amalgamation of all the feelings I was having about civil rights and anti-war and the wonderful music coming out of San Francisco and my own emergent sexual liberation feelings. And it was all wrapped up in that quartet of plays, Mysteries and Smaller Pieces, Antigone, Frankenstein, and Paradise Now. And it was a real um, revelation for me. And I, I became a complete groupie. I followed the group to New York and Boston and uh, had a lot of ups and downs. I saw them again in London in 1969. And when I think about the chaos of those times and the risks they were taking, you know, not all of the New York intelligentsia thought very highly of Paradise Now. It was too much, too anarchic, too much shouting. Was she at was Paradise Now at Yale? Is that the piece you saw? Robert Brustein invited Judith and Julian to begin their American tour of 1669 <clears throat> at Yale. It was uh, Paradise Now or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paradise Now was, was uh, Tell us a bit, how did it feel on campus? I mean, we are also at the university. What, how was that moment? Well, you know, racial politics were very hot. The anti-war movement was very hot. I hadn't been involved in the SDS people on the far left very much. Uh, I was concerned with a little bit with LSD and marijuana and sexual liberation. And I, I had a lot of frustration. I was kind of a slow bloomer as a gay man and uh and the living theater swept into town with silk and leather and patchouli oil and exotic long-haired beautiful people and uh, i remember we all had a little meeting some of us uh alternative students with julian in a garden and we said julian what do we do and he said you have to figure that out for yourself we were a little disappointed but but uh we took the lesson and on the first night of paradise now when people started to go out into the streets after four or five hours of of the uh, play and the, and the play actually was quite formally structured in spite of the chaotic image judith the the pupil of piscotter had created quite a structured anarchic pacifist uh procession towards an ideal uh meditation on paradise and people were taking other people on their shoulders and walking down York Street towards the next intersection. And I said to Judith, who was standing with Bob Brustein, would you like to get on my shoulders? And she said, sure. So I took her away from Bob Brustein that night. And uh, we went down the street and two policemen, it was like a, a scene out of an Andy Griffith show. They didn't know what they were seeing, all these people semi-naked walking down the street late at night on a June, uh, September evening. And they crossed their two police cars and they arrested several people. And we sang America the Beautiful and uh, then dispersed. And there was a short trial a week later in which the charges were thrown out. Uh, Brustein regretted the presence of the Living Theater. It was too much. He had a rebellion of students on his hands in the drama school after that. And one of the people who championed us, Gordon Rogoff, he let go from the faculty. Mm -hmm. uh, and Brustein, you know, is a great man, but he's become, you know, kind of center left. And he had that long debate with August Wilson about political correctness. And uh, he was what he was. And the Living Theater just streamed through the United States that year with many arrests and chaos and uh they got to the west coast finally and ran out of money and who bailed them out but jim morrison paid the hotel bill in los angeles he had seen the group and was enthusiastic about them and his biographers have blamed the living theater for the fact that two weeks later in miami he exhibited mimed fellatio i think was all he did i don't think he exposed himself but that stopped the the tour of the doors and ended the doors run so to speak they blame the living theater for that which i think is very unfair mm -hmm. uh, yeah. but the result of the american tour with many of the actors was uh, a feeling of frustration because it didn't really lead to the pacifist revolution that they were hoping for there was too much yelling and screaming and the work of the living theater of of uh, 
the time after that took a decided more mellow tone in the 70s with street theater and the work in Brazil and then in Brooklyn and America and Italy. We were much more gentle. We tried to be much more seductive with our entreaties to change. In some ways, every living theater play is the same. There's always this effort to promote the beautiful nonviolent anarchist revolution. Uh, once a person said to Julian, I understand the anarchism thing, and I understand the nonviolent thing, but what about beautiful? What does that mean? He said, well, if it's not beautiful, I'm not interested. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Judith and Julian really dedicated their lives totally to these ideas, whether it was monetarily, and I think Julian died a little too soon, maybe not having, I always say if he'd had a couple of colonoscopies uh, in his 50s, he might have still been alive. But he died far too soon at the age of 60. And Judith carried on, but she threw every penny into that black hole of Clinton Street. It's like owning a yacht. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't... I don't have too many regrets. You know, I, I was invited by a festival in Spain last year, the great Valladolid Festival of the Streets, Teatro y Arte a la Calle, to receive an award on behalf of the Living Theater. And it said, the most revolutionary theater of the 20th century, their words. And they had a newspaper that they gave out for the festival. And I was in the centerfold. And based on an interview, it said, he gave his life to the living theater and has no regrets. <laughs> mm -hmm. But if there is one regret, it's of course, I'm on Medicaid and food stamps now, and there's no pension and the living theater never paid into, uh, you know, social security. Mm -hmm. I never ended up in academe, you know, like with tenure or anything like that. Uh, so I'm, I'm a little in difficulty. I have a few assets that I throw over the side every once in a while, but uh, in my sixth floor walk up, I'm a little worried about the future, but uh, I do have this wonderful legacy. And as you said, so much of the work now that I do, uh, the, the Living Theater has done some projects in Brazil and Mexico recently. We created a big new show called Electric Awakening, sort of one-time events. Uh, and I did a co-production with a theater in Oslo, Norway, based on Judith's last notes called Venus and Mars with the Grusom Athens Theater, the great theater of Oslo. But most of my work now is archival with the Fondazione Morra in Naples, which has an enormous living theater archive and owns all of Julian Beck's paintings from the 40s and 50s. In fact, Judith selling all this material to Fondazione Morra was the major support for uh, the Clinton Street years and I've worked over there with them. Uh, they recently wanted me over there for eight months and I, I couldn't leave New York for eight months. I'm like Gulliver here. I'm tied down by rent and utilities and credit card bills and I can leave for maybe a month or a month and a half but I couldn't leave for eight months. And uh, we're also overseeing lots of publications. Shall I, shall I do the little book tour? Sure, why not? Uh, this is a, a brand new book. It's called How Happy We Were. And it's a diary that I found of Julian's month in prison in 1957 with the Catholic worker people, Dorothy Day, Amon Hennessy. And they were protesting the mandatory order to take cover during an anti-air raid drill, if you can imagine such a thing happening. Uh, there were several of these in the 50s, and they were very much part of the Ban the Bomb movement and Pacifists and War Resistance League. And this is a, a wonderful diary of Julian's month in prison because they went out and protested and were promptly arrested and adjudicated and all given a month in prison. And uh, Julian writes lyrically for 100 pages about his time in the tombs and on Hart Island, which was the predecessor of... Uh, Rikers Island. Hmm. And uh, he writes lyrically about his feelings about his fellow prisoners, about the racial situations, about all the propositions that he got all the time. He was 
32 and a good looking young man, and he would never assent to these propositions because he was sort of worried about putting the reputation of the Catholic worker in jeopardy. But he said, am I being elite and ruling class by not accepting these propositions? And it's kind of cute. Yeah, it anyway, we, uh, Michael Smith with Fast Books Press has put out this. Great. Has a cover Great. by Luba Lukova. Great of Michael to do it. Didn't she become a Catholic saint, Dorothy Day, or am I wrong? Uh, well, she's up for sainthood. Dorothy she's up for sainthood, right? Yeah, she should be made a saint. She, uh, she had a very racy beginning with John Reed in the 20s and had an out of wedlock child. And then with uh, Amon Hennessy and I think a guy named Peter Morin, they formed the Catholic Worker uh, Movement, which was really like St. Francis, you know, living in almost near poverty and feeding the poor, very much against war, mm -hmm. against abortion too, but very pacifist. And uh, she lived to be quite old. I remember seeing her once as a very elderly white haired lady when we did one of our plays in uh, 1973. Yeah, and, uh, she and stayed in touch. Part of a also Catholic history of protest, as we know, and the Times that reported so well about it, I think only 5% of the Catholic uh, uh, churchgoers are black, and the uh, Catholic Church does not support a Black Lives Matter as they should. Um, they uh, are questioning uh, the, the motive, say, say some of them are atheists. Uh, and, uh, and in, instead of saying one big truth that everybody agrees on, you shall not inflict suffering, you shall not kill black people, you shall not shoot them if you're a policeman, you know, if it's not the very, very last uh, uh, um, uh, 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 resolve, uh, resolve to, to, to get out of a situation. And they do say, you know, there might be atheists, whatever, but you know, if Catholic Church does uh, uh, rallies on whatever abortion, they will not ask anybody, oh, are you also an atheist or not? You know, they will, everybody for the new, for the new judge they are supporting and the Supreme Court, they will of course um, gather all the support, but um, it's uh, disappointing and it's wrong. They've been wrong on the fight on the civil rights. They've been wrong when slavery was in the US. And I think this is an important part of history that, um, that needs to be uh, told. So it's great that Michael and you put that, that book out, that, that there is a history. And um, There was, of course, the movement of liberation theology, especially in South America and Central America. Archbishop Romero, who was assassinated in mm -hmm. uh, El Salvador. Uh, when we were arrested in, in Oro Preto in Brazil in 1971, two people who signed the arrest warrant were Catholic priests. They were very much against our presence. They, they didn't know what we were doing, but the fact that they didn't know meant that it was bad. That it was bad. Tell us a bit. You just started. You went to Yale. You finished your studies. You joined a company and you end up two months in jail. Yeah. Well, I had been very excited by the Living Theater all through 68, 69. Saw them again at the Roundhouse in England and uh, went back to Yale to finish up. And it was a real season of politics at Yale that year. In the spring, the university went out on strike on behalf of the Black Panthers and against the bombing of Cambodia. And I was the student strike uh, communication committee chief. And I had a real season of, of activism. And then I didn't really know what to do. I was still wanting to define my sexuality. I came down to New York a little bit and visited with Joe Chaikin and, and wandered about. Uh, and then I had a friend in Brazil who I could crash with. And I knew the Living Theater was in Brazil. So I went down to Brazil and uh, went to visit them in Oro Preto, went up from Sao Paulo to Oro Preto. And uh, Judith and Julian remembered me. I was really surprised and, and uh, complimented that they all remembered me from the shows. And they invited me to stay. Uh, years later, Judith said, well, we thought you had money. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, so I stayed there. And it was a time of, for me, and I've written about it now in a little memoir, 1968 to 1971, uh, I think I'm still here, I wonder why, which is a line I said for many years in the play Antigone as the guard after he arrests Antigone. But uh, 
in Oro Preto, I was a little out of my depth. Uh, I was living with a bunch of real hipsters. I can say that much. And I was in love with this young guy in the company. And, you know, after a few days, it kind of mutated and I was crying in the corner and this kind of thing. And uh, it was tough to uh, adjust. And uh, I was trying to be creative about the plays. Judith showed me her diary to read. So I showed her my diary to read. And one morning, I think she had got up on the wrong side of bed. She said, your diary is nothing but a bunch of junk of a self-centered, spoiled boy. And I was in tears, totally wiped out. And Julian was in the background rattling the coffee cup, saying nothing. And so I worked very hard in the remaining weeks that I spent with them to do something constructive and worthwhile. And I was beginning to reach a certain plateau of conscientiousness when the arrest happened. They came bombing in on the first day of this winter festival that we had applied to do a play for. And they arrested us all in a very hysterical way and took us into Belo Horizonte to the DOPS headquarters, D-O-P-S, Departimento de Ordine Politica y Social, which was the secret police of the era. Uh, and one night, uh, I mean, it was one night in this uh, detention center and one of the boys was tortured with electroshocks. And then we began a long period of uh, incarceration. All the men were in a prison farm. The three women were in a women's prison in Belo Horizonte and Judith and Julian were kept in the secret police prison, which turned out to be a good thing because they could coordinate and plan our strategy. And the trial began after about a month and uh, it wasn't really going anywhere. And our great friend and producer, Ruth Escobar from Sao Paulo, great woman of the theater, said, well, we've got to do something. We've got to get other lawyers. And with $10,000 that Julian's mother sent down to Brazil, which today would have been what? $50,000. Uh, Julian's parents had quite a bit of money. Uh, we got new lawyers who went to Brasilia and Steve Israel, who had slipped out of the clutches of the police at the beginning of the arrest, was back in New York organizing the campaign to free us and people like Jean-Paul Sartre and Arthur Miller and all the film people of Italy had written big protest statements against our arrest. And at the end, Steve did this wonderful thing. He sent down a list to the newspapers in Brazil, including Mayor Lindsay, Jane Fonda, Bob Dylan, Mick Jagger, and an enormous list of other people. It hit the newspapers like a bombshell, all these big pictures. And uh, it was too much. The president of Brazil said, who are these people? I'm being besieged by them all the time. What's going on? Get rid of them. And so we were deported. Now that list that Steve sent was not, it was fake. He told everybody on the list that they had signed it afterwards and nobody ever complained, but it did its, it did its magic. Mm -hmm. And we were all deported. Uh, finally, we were, we were lucky. Uh, okay. we, we met yeah. many people who were not so lucky. Yeah. 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 And, and we yeah. said to these people, you know, we don't have money. We, we can't get you out of prison. What do you want us to do to help you? And they said, go out and tell the story tell the story about what's happening here. And that was the genesis of the play, Seven Meditations on Political Sadomasochism, which we performed for five years, over 300 performances for many, many years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it is a, an incredible time to think. It's a time when also theater was in the center of, uh, of cultural awareness, you know, uh, perhaps in a way also as TV shows are now, it's a time I think Julian Mack and Drew Smith were on the cover of Time magazine, they were part of a discussion, part of a social conscious, part of the idea that theater works through problems that society has, reflects as offers uh, some uh, uh, possibilities, perhaps even answers, but so highlighting it and that this is important. And uh, hearing you as a student at the Yale, you know, saying I'm gonna go to the living theater and uh, Often now one has a feeling uh, in uh, some American universities, they teach how to get to Broadway, how to be successful, how to be your own brand, how to support the machine, how to, um, how to uh, be part. 
um, of of the big uh, um, of that big machine. Even so, I think Piscato, who was uh, George Miller's teacher, said in his famous courses in the New School, he would say, "Go to Broadway. I want you all to go and see that." And nobody understood. And he said, "We have to know what the enemy is doing." That was his idea. Said Heiner Müller or Brecht or others that the apparatus of the theater itself also is a representation of a state or of a power and theater even so you're inside it, but still if you want to have the big theaters, but still you also have to be subversive. You have to show what's wrong. You have to be, as you say, on the side. So people who are in, piss, in prison, people who are wronged and the living theater has done that over, over such a long time. And, um, and you have all our, you know, our respect for that. As a question told me, you now work for almost 50 years or 49, 50 years in theater. Um, was it worth it? Was it? Yeah, we have lots of people listening, also young artists. Who tell us what, what, what do you think about it now in your room in COVID? You can go out. You say you have food stamps. You say uh, I can't even accept a grant because I'm going to lose support here if I leave the country. Um, <clears throat> so of course, disgraceful that there's no artist insurances like in Germany or France or other countries for great artists and. People have made a real contribution. And if you guys haven't, who else has? So was it worth it? Was, what was the idea? What, did you realize what you guys wanted to do? And was it worth it? It certainly was worth it from a moral standpoint. I have no regrets on that score. We told the truth. We did the good work. Uh, we communicated with thousands of people. We inspired thousands of people. Uh, a book recently came out, put together by a French woman named Emeline Jouve about Avignon 1968 and the Living Theater. And it's interviews with about 30 people. It's only in French uh, at this point. And some of those people are still furious at the Living Theater for causing such a ruckus. And they blame the tension that Jean Villard felt in those days. Uh, and he actually did have a heart attack later that year and passed away. And some people blame the Living Theater for the strain upon him. But there are many other people who write in that book about how the Living Theater changed their life for the better and uh, put them on the path that they have been comfortable with since then. And the family of Jean Villard a few years after that said to Judith, oh, we hold no uh, bad feelings with you. And uh, so I don't think we feel guilty on that score. It was a crazy time. The, the government of Avignon that month had gone fascist. And there was a lot of scare that fascist groups would beat up the living theater. We've been close to that, always holding up the mirror to the society, to its hypocrisy. Judith famously would never vote. I have always voted. And Judith knew I voted and she never gave me trouble about that. She said, you must do what you feel you should do. Uh, financially, sure, I, I could feel that there's some regret. It's always good to have a day job uh, the way most of our young people who are doing the Alamite projects do have. Uh, that's important, you gotta get by. I have a few irons left in the fire. I'm not entirely uh, in the street. And I have some very good friends who help support me, which is uh, wonderful. But I certainly have no regrets about speaking the truth and uh, trying to do new forms of theater. One of Judith's last experiments on Clinton Street was to develop uh, We've always had immersive theater since Paradise Now. The Living Theater has always been a pioneer with immersive theater, which is so much the rage these days. But in Judith's last plays, she wanted to develop a uh, form called free flow. Mm -hmm. And the free flow was kind of a improvisation with a point of view. She said, don't wave your arms, it's not dancing. It's moving through the space. Usually the audience was in the space with us without chairs. And we would take themes from the play that we had been performing and move in a kind of collective movement with the audience into a kind of uh, new 
reality of not dance, but movement with conscientiousness. And this was what Judith would call the free flow. And it was still very experimental even by the last time we were working with it under Judith's direction in No Place to Hide. Uh, yeah, yeah, I saw that. He was working up until the end to embrace the audience, to love the audience. Uh, Paradise Now had a lot of love, the audience, but it also had this anger about, get out of your seats. I remember Jimmy Anderson, Afro-American actor of great charisma, he would say, be the American Indian. <laughs> this kind of uh, hectoring of the audience uh, and not afraid of a little bit of cultural appropriation here and there. Uh, but uh, we were always looking for the truest uh, iteration of relationships with the audience. And that I will always have with me and never forget, I do workshops sometimes. I did a couple of them in Sardinia last year and uh, it comes back. You bring it back with the people you're teaching and you encourage them uh, to open the door to new possibilities. I tell you, if somebody offered me a role on Broadway, I would do it in a flash. Uh, Julian was offered Broadway by Michael Butler, the producer of Hair, in 1969 to do Paradise Now on Broadway. And he said, no. Uh, and sometimes when Julian was sick, he, he accepted these movie roles in Cotton Club and Poltergeist 2. And some people said, you're working with the enemy. And he said, I need the money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was with Pasolini, right, in the Oedipus. Um, yes, so. he played great Tyrese. Film. Yes. One of the great films, actually, of a It's a beautiful, film. beautiful film. He had a very funny experience, I'll, I'll recount briefly, on the set in Morocco with uh, Tiresias and Pasolini. They put contact lenses in his eyes to make them blue, and dust and sand got in between the contact lenses. And when that happens, you go blind for a while. So far, a while, Julian S. Tiresias was ac actually blind. <laughs> Incredible. Incredible. Yeah. Through that, through that, what uh, supposed to make him look blind, uh, he became, he became blind. Um, Tom, there are really also artists listening, I think also students, you know, we, I, we hear a lot also around the world. Your experience of 50 years, what, what can you say to young artists where you say, this is what we learned and perhaps in a time of COVID or after the TAC, the time after um, COVID, what do you think is of significance? What you guys found that worked? Well, it's always good to have a period of reflection and if nothing is happening, something is always happening. Don't despair. We're all cooped up now. Uh, we're zooming this way and that way. There's a lot of communication going on. I'm doing a lot of reading. Thank you so much for that volume of Anna Akhmatova. I read the whole thing. Yeah. It's wonderful. She is, she is just a, a great, great. And her life, you know, she yeah. went from struggle to struggle from contradiction to contradiction. It's certainly an inspiration to us today. I don't think any of us have been living in times as difficult as she went through. Yeah. Uh, Stalin. Uh, but I, I remember after Brazil, uh, Judith and Julian thought they would tour America and raise money and maybe take the group back to uh, South America to continue the relationship with the third world. That didn't happen. And they embarked on a period of study. Judith and Julian were nothing if not great uh, intellectual uh, educators and researchers. They wrote books. They, Judith was always writing in her diary. They were always creating uh, new projects. We worked for two years to create a thing we called the Red Book, which was a kind of a directory of all kinds of plays that could be done for all kinds of different audiences, factory workers, poorest of the poor, people in insane asylums in schools, uh, the bourgeoisie, of course. And this was the genesis of the legacy of Cain, which we worked on throughout the 70s. 
but some people like Stephen Ben Israel at the time said, well, we should do a play. We should get working. We should go out and be busy. And Judith and Julian didn't want to do that quite yet. They wanted to reflect and to study. And that is certainly a period which we are experiencing now under COVID. And, and you know, you said I was a director. I'm not really a director or a playwright, not like Richard Foreman or Peter Schumann or Meredith Monk or uh, Lee Brewer. I've always been basically a worker in the vineyards of the avant-garde, as I like to say. Mm -hmm. Whatever Julian asked me to do, I would do it. Whatever Judith asked me to do, I would do it. If they had a problem in a play about what to say, what to do, I would suggest ideas. If they needed a room cleaned out, I would clean out the room. If they needed a meal cooked, I would cook the meal. At one point, Julian, while we were waiting for trial in Brazil, said to me, well, if nothing else in the Living Theater, you'll learn how to cook and you'll learn a foreign language. And both became true, actually. Mm -hmm. I can cook pretty well, vegetarian, uh, although I'm actually not a complete vegetarian. But whenever we lived together in group houses, we were always vegetarian. Two days was, yeah. But, you know, when you're young, you have your health, hopefully, and your energy. And that goes for a lot. I never worried too much about whether I was doing the right thing or not, aside from maybe sexual frustrations and things of that sort, personal uh, worries. I always used to think that because I was in the living theater throughout the 70s and early 80s, which was sort of like a nuclear family and I was a bit timid sexually, that's why I didn't get AIDS. I, I think if I had stayed in New York and lived in New York, I would have gotten the, the dread taint, as Jeff Weiss always used to call it, the dread taint. Uh, he's another great mentor for me, Jeff Weiss. Great. That's how the rent gets paid. Uh, wonderful performer and director. So I wouldn't be too depressed. Uh, I mean, we wonder when is this thing going to be over? Now Brooklyn is exploding in little hot spots. It's resurging here and there. And the president is off the charts. We're having the most hysterical election in my memory. And I certainly hope he goes away. Uh, if he doesn't, we're, we're in for it. Uh, so it's a perilous time. I would say stay in touch with your friends, talk, communicate, telephone, try to see each other safely. Uh, what more can you say? Carry on. Mm. I think. Yeah. From the, the methods you had, you talked a bit about it, you know, going street theater or factories or what you said, or prison, insane, insane, whatever, you know. Um, so, so you were, what a lot of people talked about from Emil Oral to uh, Ostermeyer to others on the program here um, uh, from Africa, from uh, Asia, Indonesia, everywhere. So, you know, we have to get out of the big theaters. We have to engage. We have to be on streets. We have to be in places. We have to be on sites. We have to take the idea of community really serious. Um, what forms did you guys experiment with? What forms worked? What, what can you tell us a little bit what you did, what was at that time um, unheard of? I remember Eugenio Barba on this program said, listen, uh, we, I survived in the beginning because I did a workshop. You don't, doesn't mean anything to you. But at the time there were no workshops or you were at an acting school or directly, or you, and when you were rejected, that was it. He was actually rejected as, as so many of uh, part of his theaters. And he said, we built our own thing. It's incredible what he did. So, but how, wh what forms did you do at that time that uh, we can learn from or should rethink about, you know, what, what, what is your advice? Well, at the beginning of the seventies, when we started to work on the legacy of Kane, that was our real big outreach where we did street theater and went out into various communities, which of course- What did you do? Tell us a bit. What, how did it look like? It can't, can't be done until we get over the COVID, but for the future, uh, we created, for example, a half hour biomechanic. We use very much the biomechanics of Meyerhold. Yeah. He used the biomechanics 
as a way to train his actors. So in a play like The Magnificent Cuckold or Mystery Booth, you know, they would all be moving in a kind of hysterical choreography. And we took these exercises and actually used them as dramatic forms in our street theater, Stringing the Bow. Uh, we created a, a half hour play to support the United Farm Workers in the grape and lettuce boycott. And it was called the Strike Support Oratorio. And it had an oppression section and a work section and a uh, struggle section. And it was a series of questions. What's a strike? What's a boycott? How can you? How can I? A tune written for us actually by Frederick Shevsky. Uh, and we combined this with biomechanical etudes of moving down the street uh, block by block. And at the end of it, we formed a series of barricades in front of a local supermarket and we answered all the question. A strike is a, et cetera, et cetera. A boycott is a, all in song. It was all sung and we were dressed in purple and green for grapes and lettuce. And we had little megaphones on our heads like the coxswains use in the boats, you know, the rowing boats. So it would project our voices. Uh, we did the, the money tower, which was a five story high tower representing the social system. Uh, we performed it outside of factories and, and schools in Pittsburgh and then eventually in Italy. And it would take a long time to build it. It took about six hours to build it. So that would become a spectacle in and of itself. And uh, let me get rid of this phone call. Sorry. I'll have to call him back. Maybe someone from the living complaining. You haven't mentioned them yet. <laughs> it, it actually was uh, yeah. our art gallery that's that's uh, uh, brokering archives. So I, I do yeah. have to call. I do have to yeah. call him back. So we we're doing the money tower, and. Uh, we would go out from the money tower and have questions with the audience. We began to often in our plays go out and have stop the action and have a question with the audience. We did a four or five hour play called Six Public Acts that went uh, in a pilgrimage around a city. A house of the state would be a school. The house of property would be an insurance agency. The house of war would be a police station. The house of love would be a beautiful park. The house of death would be a church. The house of money would be a bank. And we would do these rituals in front of these various places. And then there would be a bell. We always had what we called a time shaman who throughout the rituals would be doing a biomechanical etude, you know, a, a clap and a freeze and uh, would tell the time, always telling the time. So we always knew what the time was. And uh, after each ritual, we would say, now is the time to discuss the destruction of the house of money. Exactly. Now is the time to talk with the audience. Exactly. I'm sort of improvising the lyrics here. And we would have a five minute discussion with the audience about what can you do? Not preaching, but very intimate conversations. And then there would be a bell rung now it is time to go to the house of the state. Exactly. And we'd go into a freeze. No matter if we were in the midst of a important discussion, we would just go into a freeze and stop. And then we would begin a procession, a stop and start procession, a biomechanical procession uh, with a theme. There was a money procession. There was a love procession. There was a state procession. So we would use, and, and these uh, archetypes, these uh, almost like Jungian archetypes, we were, all took them from the work of Leopold von Sacher Masoch, uh, who wrote Venus and Furs mm -hmm. and actually wrote a big uh, project of masters and slaves using these six uh, archetypes. And Judith and Julian took that uh, idea from Sacher Masoch. Hmm. So, uh, they did their homework and uh, mixed it with biomechanics and with these uh, direct approaches to the audience. Uh, 
that was a large part of our work in the legacy of Cain during the 70s. And we thought up an idea to do 150 plays. I think we did only about 40 of them. Some of them were little short street plays. We did one play called Why Are We Afraid of Sexual Freedom, where we mimed sexual positions uh, in a stop-start way, which was often quite scandalous to the audiences on the street in Italy. But it certainly made an impression. And then after these mimed sexual positions, which were quite provocative, clothed, we were not naked by any means, the men and the women separated and the men would go up the steps of a church and do this rejection action against the women and the women would cower but then turn around and start dialoguing with the audience at that point and the men came down from the church steps uh, church <clears throat> officials didn't like us using their churches as a background but yeah yeah, no, I think uh, um, the living theater very openly and uh, as a strategy it went on streets, used the streets as we do not need the famous playwright, we do not need set decorations, we don't need theater lights, we don't even need a theater, we can do it on, on the street and it's all, um, you know, we know about it now, perhaps even slightly, you know, it's a little bit less prominent now we, are, all everybody talks about it again, but it is a a most serious way of engaging, as Peter Schumann said, when he was in the Lower East Side and said we got commissioned by Puerto Rican mothers whose sons yeah. came back or did not come back from the war and they got these letters, we would like to be a sorry to inform you. And uh, they commissioned him and he said we did it in Spanish and we did it on the streets where the people were. So how did it look like? Did you come in a car? Did you announce it? Were there flyers? Uh, how do you did it in front of a prison of an asylum? Or no, we were, we how were does all, it work? We were all dressed in red, yellow, and orange. And uh, we hardly had any props. And we had a gathering uh, scene for Six Public Acts, uh, which was uh, a, a reversion of uh, one of the uh, choruses from Antigone. We often recycled from one play to another. And uh, it was a big crowd gatherer. And then we were off. We just, we had a, a map of the city and which we worked out with, with our sponsors ahead of time. And sometimes the map was given out as a program so that the audience knew where they were gonna be going. And we had these processions we usually would arrive in one of our little Volkswagen buses and park it off to the side and uh, go back to it when the play was over. Uh, we didn't do too much announcement, you know, like with loudspeakers. Uh, we just uh, showed up and started doing the play in the middle of the city and often it would stop traffic. Of course, many artists and intellectuals knew about it ahead of time. Uh, we did the plays in the middle of Genoa, in the middle of Naples, Bologna, Munich, uh, cities in France, uh, all over the place. And uh, it did create quite a bit of uh, mayhem. Sometimes in certain southern Italian cities, little gangs of boys would start attacking us for fun, kind of. We had to protect the women. Uh, and uh, so we just, we uh, invaded the urban space. Uh, without so permission, we, without selling tickets, people, we some do, some not. So it was kind of a guerrilla action theater. And um, we usually had permission from the city fathers, uh, like the city of Bologna sponsored us or the city of Naples or the city of Genoa. <clears throat> we rarely did it without permission. Mm -hmm. Once in a while, we'd do a, a small 15-minute play, maybe an anti-militarist play, uh, without permission. Uh, I think when we did the play in Porto, Portugal, one of the little plays, Why Are We Afraid of Sexual Liberation? We did it without permission with a workshop, and uh, we did those mimed sexual positions and we finished the play, we did it. But a lot of townspeople from the outlying areas 
were scandalized. They said, something terrible has happened. Something terrible has happened. And they told the police and the police didn't know what had happened, but they knew something terrible had happened. So they started arresting us all. And we were rather identifiable because of our costumes. And we were all arrested for four hours. And I remember being in the back of a paddy wagon and a nice young girl who was in the workshop looked up to me and she said, don't worry, my father is the culture minister of the city. Uh, we'll get out. <laughs> you will get out. Yeah, yeah. I, I also know you do it at 42nd Street on Times Square in front of the U.S. Army. Oh, the years, building. We, did, uh, uh, we did the play, uh, not in my name, against the death penalty. Yes, we we did. We did that play in the 90s for maybe 50 to 75 times. Uh, whenever an execution was scheduled, we would go out and do it in honor of the victim. It was a a pretty simple little agitprop play of about 15 minutes. And because we didn't have a sound system, we didn't need permission. I don't know what it would be like now with, well, of course, the COVID, but before the COVID, Times Square has become like a little Disneyland with all those cartoon characters. Right. The last time we did anything in Times Square was back in uh, 2013 or 2014. Uh, we did a couple of scenes from Seven Meditations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it is, it, it is quite, quite stunning that history, that long history, and do this almost truly as a high priest in a way of theater and uh, or as a rabbi or whatever, what she created, how many people she touched, but also the contribution the living made as a symbol, as a real symbol, but also symbolic, but an imaginary representation of something that is possible, that is uh, uh, at least also for these moments and what art and theater and performance um, can do. Often, and you alluded to it, they looked at anarchists or they looked at, you know, they were smoking pot. I mean, I knew Judas a little, little bit, not a lot, but, you know, I visited also her and, uh, um, and, um, and she came to the seagull and she was, and she was also a performer. We did the Poets Theater Day. She performed in the Frank O'Hara play. She was incredibly disciplined. I think this is something to perhaps also to talk about in the theater. What you did in one way, it was very open, very free, improvised. And then there was also, at least I have the feelings that was a, a mechanism behind it, like a biomechanic or whatever. You know, the, um, the kind of uh, philosophers that there's like cold water and warm water, and that comes together, something happens. Just the warm, just the cold, or cold and warm air, you know, when it, when it collides. So tell us a little bit about that discipline of the living theater for the, and the craft. Judith and Julian were very disciplined. Julian worked very hard. He was the first one into the theater and the last one to leave. He formally gave up painting in 1958 to devote himself to opening the Living Theater on 59th Street, but a uh, 40th, um, 14th Street, I'm sorry. Uh, but he was always making sets. He was always uh, designing. He was always working. He was always paying the bills. It's hard to imagine him running the theater before the age of computers and cell phones. He would often be down at the concierge in whatever hotel we were at, calling the next producer planning the next trip. There are lots of notes that are in our archives of him crossing off, you know, the salaries for every day, every week for all the actors. And Judith was always at work with her desk. She would always have a desk in whatever hotel she was in, where she would sit and write her diaries and make her plans. She always designed playbooks, uh, director's books. Uh, she fought to become a director. She insisted on taking Piscotter's directing class, and he didn't want to have her at first. He was a pretty conservative man in some ways. And he said, a woman cannot be a director. They have children and so forth. And she said, and then I did the most embarrassing thing I could think of. I cried. And he took pity on me. And he said, well, all right, you can come to the director's class. And uh, she was always very disciplined. You know, it's not always realized that she was also very religious. She was the daughter of a rabbi, grew up in a uh, shul. There were always ceremonies going on. It was a, a, a tiny shul in the bottom of Central Synagogue that Max Molina ran uh, until he passed away in 1942. And he was always involved in trying to save Jewry from the Nazis, 
ringing the alarm bell before many other people did. And uh, Judith grew up around ceremonies and religions and prayers, and, and she was not orthodox. She rewrote the Seder as an anti-patriarchal vegetarian uh, ceremony with heavy doses of Allen Ginsberg's poem, Howl, in the celebration. Uh, but she would always say the bracha every... Something you uh, might publish, by the way. It would be great to have that, you know? Seder. Yes, well, I have copies of it. Uh, we should... We should publish it, yeah. uh, Judith's uh, Seder, yes. But I'm sorry for interrupting. No, yeah. not at all. Uh, in fact, more books. Judith's diaries are being edited by Kate Bredesen of Reed College. They may be out next year, a selection of all of her diaries. Uh, but uh, she believed in a certain holiness and a certain positivity, a certain optimism. She always said to Julian, don't put yourself down, don't criticize yourself, which he does do in his diaries and journals. Julian was more an agnostic, really, uh, than a, uh, I mean, he observed uh, the tradition of, of Judaism, of course, but uh, he was uh, uh, more an agnostic, uh, open spiritual person. But definitely they were both very, very disciplined. Uh, I once said to Carl Bissinger, the great uh, photographer and peace activist, Judith smokes so much marijuana. And Carl said, well, maybe she needs it. You know, and that's the truth about marijuana. I've spent 70 years of my life under this terrible oppression of marijuana being illegal. And it's one of the biggest lies that has been foisted upon the American public and the world as a consequence since the 1930s. There's no reason, and we're beginning to realize it now with the legalization out West and mm -hmm. Massachusetts and Vermont. And it's gonna be on the ballot in New Jersey next month. Yeah. But I'm afraid it's in the back seat right now in New York because of all these other problems. Mm. But it, it should be legal. CDB is very good for the body. THC a little bit, you know, in its moment, you know, to help you sleep or combat depression. Uh, and it's been used as a social oppression. You know, if you're an African-American man and you break a parole with one joint of marijuana, they can put you away for years. It's been used in a terribly oppressive way to increase the prison population. Yeah, um, yeah. No, it is, it is true. And I think they have always been fighting um, also um, um, for, for, for use of that, but also, you know, as you said, for the human rights. It's, it's stunning, I think. I don't know uh, how many times Julius Melina got arrested, but on the other hand, she was a spiritual person, you know, and her friend, this is Doris's day, who is, uh, you know, up for sainthood. Um, she, were, she was a director, she was a writer, and also a great actress, if she uh, performed, if one, one see her or saw her, and she did, you know. Uh, I think the, the, last time she, the last time she got arrested, we were doing a, a, a play called No Sir against the uh, recruitment for the Iraq War with students from the New School at that recruitment station in Times Square. This was several years ago. And uh, some counter protesters showed up and were screaming at us. And we had done it before, but the police didn't like the chaotic situation that was developing. So they went up to Judith, who was on the side, and said, stop this. And she said, I don't know how to stop it. And they took her in. They took her into the kiosk. She was technically briefly under arrest. And we managed to do the play a couple more times. It was conditioned on the Mm -hmm. film of the Jumbotron, the recruitment Jumbotron. We were doing scenes in relation to the Jumbotron. There's another form which we experimented with. And finally, the policeman came up to me with, you know, the, the captain. He said, stop this now. And I said, all right, you know, and we stopped it. And then we had to go to liberate Judith from the kiosk. And it took a little while. The policeman said to her, this man stopped when I told him to stop and you didn't. No good, you know, but he let her go. <laughs> let her go. Yeah, yeah. She must have been over a hundred times. I forget. She once said she, she kept count of it, I think, how much. Well, time 12 spent. times. I, I don't know how many times. Uh, in, in, her, in her life. No, it was quite a high number. Um, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, when, she, when, she, when she came in. So um, 
you are, uh, you have, you, I interrupted you earlier, you have other book projects, right? Other things that came out or you worked on. Tell us a little bit about, you know, the, how to keep up that legacy and how do we, you know, learn from that? How do we keep it with us? What is that book? Yeah. This is Daily Light, Daily Speech, Daily Life, a long poem Julian wrote, which has been put out again in Italy. It's, uh, the uh, publisher is Empiria. Uh, info Empiria, E M P I R I A dot com. And they're in Rome. It's a wonderful poetic series that he wrote years ago. Uh, you've seen uh, How Happy We Were. The, mm -hmm. This is a book that's been put out by Casa della Poesia dot org in Salerno, Italy. It's a long poem by Julian called Revolution and Counter Revolution. And it has beautiful pictures by Julian inside it from the collection of the Fondazione Morva. Uh, Michael Smith is going to bring out two of Julian's plays shortly at Fast Books Press. There will be uh, Prometheus at the Winter Palace from 1978 and uh, The Archaeology of Sleep from 1983. And this is a book that Garrick Beck, Judith and Julian's son, wrote recently an autobiography of his years up until 1972 and growing up in the living theater it has beautiful pictures of the opening of the 14th street theater with allen ginsburg and jack kerouac and others and so well they actually got in a fight right the living theater always did poetry readings and there's one legendary fight yeah and, well uh, with corso and kerouac they would get drunk and they would make fun of the people reading. And uh, I think Frank O'Hara was doing one with uh, yeah. Kerouac and Kerouac was drunk and catcalling. And Frank finally said, well, Jack, why don't you get up and read? I've done enough, you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And you know, she was so close. William Carlos Wilson who wrote so beautiful Williams. about her. Williams, yeah. And, um, and so uh, it was an incredible um, a contribution, you know, that, that that theater made. And we miss that. And um, in is, you know, I mean, we have the great Bob Wilson, you know, who kind of, you know, also brings New York theater around, but the living theater in a way, the Castellucci, the Nushkins, the Ostermeyer, the, uh, the Mila Raos of this world, you know, this was the living theater was really a, an incredible um, 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 force. Um, we, we are slowly coming to us closer also, you know, to the end, but what do you think really is the essence? What would you say? What? you know, what is to, to keep in mind, you know, from, from the living, for, for, for the people who, who do work in theater, you know, what is uh, the, the core of the core of the message, you know, that is still truth now and everybody should keep in mind? Well, I hope we get more of Julian's work out. I think it's inevitable that someone will write a biography of him. It, there is none, right, as far uh, as I know. For 30 yeah. years. Uh, Thomas Oberender, thanks to your interview, mentioned he was interested in the work of Julian Beck. So we have corresponded and he may try to create some German translations of the life of the theater and Theandric, which are out of print, but you can find them in libraries and often on uh, uh, you know, Craigslist or Amazon. I would say read the books, continue to be inspired by Judith and Julian's uh, life. Uh, Hollywood is calling now. Uh, somebody just uh, got in touch with Garrick Beck and said they're very interested in, very interested in exploring a mini-series about Judith and Julian's life, which of course will be a young person and a young man playing Judith and Julian, and we old people may be called to be consultants in some way. Mm. I don't think they're going to use living theater actors or or anything like that. But uh, there's always something new happening. Exactly. I get requests, you know, people on the archive uh, address are asking for photographs or asking about what did you do when there are graduate students who are continuing to work very hard. Or the center in Naples is very busy with students and archivists and and people researching so it's the living theater is still living to say the least yeah. 
Yeah, and it's the, the message and the light, like light from stars. Thomas Mann said that, you know, there are many stars, yeah. galaxies far away who might not exist in physical form, but the light travels still because it's such a long time. Yes. Take a lot of years and the light reaches us. And this, I'm sure that the light of the living theater is, uh, is beaming towards us and shining, truly shining in the sense of shining the will be for a long, long time. Is this Julian Beck's pa uh, painting behind you? No. Or? no, this is a painting by Jeff Nash, who Jeff is Nash. one of our great actors in The Brig and The Connection. And he painted it around 2010 and I saved it. He's become a painter now, but uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if he does work like this. It's a little like Jean-Michel Basquiat, one of his heroes. Mm -hmm. He and I went to see Jean-Michel's grave in Greenwood Cemetery. Yeah. A very haunting. Uh, it's funny. Greenwood has lots of monuments. Yeah, yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. Jean Michel is in the cheapest section, where there are these very small stones close to the ground in long serpentine rows, and his stands out because it's, you know, there are candles and little statues and flowers and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so what do you read at the moment, or what music do you listen to? What do you, what, what keeps your mind busy? What, I, what is inspiring you? Well, every once in a while, I'll listen to Foray's Requiem or the a Prelude to Das Rangold, or you know, the rock and roll that comes across the transom. Aside from the Akhmatova, for the second time, I recently read this book, Finding Dora Mar, which is a very mm -hmm. interesting book about yeah. Picasso's, Picasso's music. mistress. A great uh, foundation also. I read uh, Walter Kampowski. Uh, oh, really? All for Nothing. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's this other book? I'm Surrounded by Books, The Morrow and the Bone by Kampowski, the German author. Mm -hmm. What else do I have here? I do read The New Yorker and New York Review of Books when I can get them. Uh, I have an Anais Nin diary, which she she speaks despairingly of the living theater. She didn't like some of the things they were doing. I've read this book recently, uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. Uh, he's an incredible Afro-American professor, theorist. He also wrote a book called uh, Stamped from the Beginning. Uh, history of racism in America. I do a lot of work with St. Mark's Church in the Bowery. They're right down the street from me. And Janine Otis, the music director there, drafted me and I do projects with her. We put on a play called Lamentations about the Episcopal Church's relationship to slavery in the 19th century. And uh, I find, you know, I'm not that religious, I'm spiritual, but the Episcopal progressive wing is a good thing. And I meet a lot of people who I wouldn't otherwise meet, professionals, uh, a very wide mix of races and genders. And so it kind of keeps me on my toes a little bit. And I, I like that. That's great. Amazing. Amazing what you have done. Amazing what you're doing. Amazing what you're going to do. Anybody listening and wants to invite Tom to teach a seminar, workshop, dramaturg, uh, publish, help him publish the books, get the things out of the living um, theater, all the universities. You know, this is still a, a company that, you know, is uh, alive in that sense and, um, and, and needs help and support. And I think also recognition. It's of importance um, to show the respect you know, for one of the great, great companies in the history. It's going thousands back of years. You know, the Living Theater will be in there as the one that also made uh, something changed with them and after them. And so uh, really, um, and uh, I can't wait to hear that. Hope also your memoirs will come out and that, uh, yeah, that, that TV series, maybe they'll have you as, an, as a consultant or you play the Brazilian president who, you know, <laughs> who didn't like the living theater so, or, or something. Maybe a, a, an upset WASP audience member. Yes, okay. yes, there you go. Um, I, we, I also uh, want to mention another person yeah. who influenced me so much, and I never forget him, is Reza Abdo. Yeah. Um, with him at the end of his life. And of yeah. course, you know, after he died, he said, nobody does my plays anymore. It all ends with me. 
Mm -hmm. That was his decision. Merce Cunningham, a little bit different. You know, they, they did some dances for two years and then now they're just a foundation. Pina Bausch, the, the Wuppertal dance theater goes yeah. on. So everybody's different. I can't imagine what the legacy of Peter Schumann will be. I'm sure it will go on. There's so many people who have been so mm -hmm. moved by him. Yeah, and it is important, you know, that you are there also as, as a witness, as a collaborator, and also as a living proof of the living um, the theater and their, their ideas. Yeah. And, um, and to really thank you for taking the time and your energy um, to share and to be with us today. This is important and, um, and of significance. So really, thank you for taking the time to well, be with thank us. Thank you, Frank. What you're doing with these uh, interviews is just wonderful. As I joked earlier, it's like the MFA I never got. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you told me. I've been quite listening. I was, I was surprised. That's a big, big, big compliment uh, for us here at the Seagull. Thank you, uh, Tom. Um, we're going to have with us uh, Seviana Stanescu. Um, um, tomorrow, she is a Romanian playwright, based a lot also in New York, taught at NYU, collaborated with Richard Schechter and others, and she is creating work around the theme of revolution, and, uh, and, um, and, um, and so she, she uh, will share us a little bit what's going on in, in Central Europe and how, what it means to do theater in, in Romania at the moment. Uh, we have Sadia Lithcott from the um, National Black Theater, who is the 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 director the executive or managing director of a company and um, which also has to think what is of what is needed what is important what should one focus on so i really look forward to hearing from her why she does her work um, what is motivating and also where she thinks we we all um, should be should be going i think we'll have Milo rao and this katya and his collaborators uh, next week who did their book on why theater that just came out at the opening i think in Ghent. Uh, we're gonna have uh, Florian Malzacher, who wrote a book about games and uh, the idea of what the living does, like interactions and uh, where he feels uh, this is strongly. And if it all works out, we'll have Jay Wegman with us and who's going to share what he thinks about, you know, what, what is the scoreboard going to do? What's important? What has to change? What can be different? So um, we hope you will uh, join us. And uh, we are planning, as I said before, a 2022 festival, the New York International Festival of the Arts, where we invite everybody to participate. And that will also be a lot of it outside in the parks and the parking lots, and hopefully finding uh, new forms um, of, of engagement, but uh, and, uh, in the spirit, reinventing, hopefully also, and using what the Living Theatre has pioneered. It's amazing, the legacy of that company, of those two artists who did change the world, uh, and the, also the world of theatre. So it was a great privilege. Thanks for HowlRound uh, for hosting us. Um, Thea and BJ and for you guys listening I know there's a lot out there so much more than when we started and when we did for four months every day so um, it's a big, a big compliment that we don't take that for granted and we hope also for you whoever is listening whether you're a student or an artist theater lover or go and any of it that's in Hungary or in South Africa or in Indonesia in the US this is for you what Tom talked to is to reach you and to you know make a contribution and to um, be part of the change we want to see, and this is um, of importance. We have to engage not only in theater, but also in life and in politics. So this is uh, the important lesson, I think, at the moment, uh, in the time we live in. So Tom, thank you, all the best, and uh, good luck with all the publishing work and the archiving, and I hope you will be able to get to Italy, at least for some amount of time. I hope so, in the future. Great, great of them to support you. Bye-bye.